Jamie with Guitarist Magazine. And I'm Richard, hi. Today uh, we're doing a deep dive demo on this, uh, the Jimi Hendrix Love Drops Flying V by Epiphone inspired by Gibson. So, a um, bit of a backstory on this one, so bear with us while we tell it, because it's quite an extraordinary story. Um, from 1967 to 1969, Jimi Hendrix uh, used a Flying V that had originally been sunburst, Hendrix painted it um, sort of ebony black and then did um, his own kind of distinctive artwork on it, and uh, which is replicated on this guitar here. And um, he used it uh, most famously on All Along the Watchtower. And it's funny, isn't it? Because a lot of people probably think that could be a strap, but it's actually not. Yeah, yeah. The, the, that intro solo, a lot of the lead stuff, I think he begins and ends it pretty much with the V, doesn't he? And the strap in the overdubs and... It's got the kitchen sink on it, hasn't it? And yeah, and but it was quite interesting. A few people, sort of, you know, th this has got twenty-two frets, and uh, if you listen to the solo, it does sort of go up beyond the normal range of a, a sort of vintage strap, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, they're they're kind of always reminds me a little bit of Stairway to Heaven. Yeah. Uh, actually, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. Um, and I think with these two fingers, yeah, yeah, um, that's a. Ben, doesn't it? Yeah, you can't do that on a yeah. strat, really, can you? He sort of plays Always that to the fade, doesn't he, on the on the record? Yes, it's yeah, just keeps it going. Outro. I remember transcribing it once, and every single bar had a slightly different rhythm on it, yeah. and I it was ending up going, dun, 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 you know, just trying yeah. to get that accurate because you know how people yeah. are about Jimmy Bless them. Yeah, and, uh, absolutely. Yes. Right. Let's give you a better view of that again. Put it back down here because my legs in the way because you can only sit a certain way with these things. So this is this is the obviously Hendrix bought the and used the late late sixties spec flying V. So that's as distinct from the Carina fifty eight um, mm. ones that were were, were made in, in small numbers and, and are impossibly rare these days. And a few different yeah they're like the knobs in a line and stuff, stuff like that yeah. didn't they and shoulders on it. And... So this is a, a mahogany bodied V um, as replicated by Epiphone um, here. It's got a single piece neck, a uh, single piece mahogany neck. It's got a mahogany body. Uh, and um, we'll go through the rest of the appointments in a moment, but we'll, it's worth just telling the rest of the backstory of the original guitar yeah, upon yeah. which this is based, because um, go back a few years, um, a chap a guitarist called Dave Brewis, who uh, played with Prefab Sprout and the Kane Grang, who was um, based in the northeast of England, uh, went into a guitar shop in Newcastle, and um, he was chatting to the owner, who said, oh, I've got a Jimi Hendrix Flying V. And... Um, uh, Dave Brewis, intrigued, took a close look at it, bought the guitar, not quite thinking it would be a really having been sort of understandable, isn't it? Because yeah. I imagine that it's a bit like the, how many 59 Les Pauls were made, how many are on the market at the moment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> equation. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they made 1,500 and only 2,000 survived. Yeah, that's yes. a joke, isn't it? <laughs> 
but basically, he, um, he, he, he took it to various authenticators. So they lifted the scratch plate and they found traces of the original artwork. They found that the um, gra wood grain on the fretboard matched um, photographs of Jimmy yeah. playing mm -hmm. his. And so it's a bit of a fairy tale story that this this kind of junk shop guitar almost, or at least a uh, you know not the not a shop that you'd expect to find an original Hendrix guitar in, um, had yielded the the Holy Grail, the, the yes. real actual Flying V that Hendrix had. Now, of course, it didn't have the artwork on it because um, somewhere after Hendrix had it, it had been refinished. So let's recap again. It started Sunburst. Jimmy painted it in ebony black. It received then this. artwork on the top, and mm. then it, it reverted to a to a different color. It'd been refinished again, and there was only traces underneath the um, scratch plate and some other details that yeah. that, that kind of tipped uh, tipped the scale in favor of being the real thing. Um, Gibson then took a close look at the guitar, and they made a limited run of sort of high end um, copies of it. And yeah. now, fast forward to twenty twenty four, uh, as part of Epiphone's you know top tier. Epiphone inspired by Gibson range. We've now got this, which is the Jimi Hendrix Love Drops um, Flying V. I must confess, I don't know what the Love Drops refers to. I'm sure somebody in the comments. Oh, will. I've got a feeling yeah. that yeah, I don't know what Love Drops actually are and whether they're available over the counter. Only, only Jimmy could sure. say. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, so basically, the as mentioned before, the Epiphone inspired by Gibson range gets all of the um, buzzers and bells. Um, yeah, because I mean, it used to be, or certainly, I know I've done this, and a lot of people I know have done this, where you'd buy something like because the guitars are really nicely made, but the the common thing was that the electrics wouldn't necessarily be that great, so you'd yeah. put some decent pots in, yeah. get some decent pickups, and then you've suddenly got something quite serious yeah. for less money. Well, they've done it for us, haven't they? Yeah. So what do we get on this then? Um, so it's the Gibson Custom Buckers, which are pretty expensive if you buy those. Mm -hmm on their own, CTS pots, so that's the US spec pots yeah. that you get in a Gibson Switchcraft uh, socket and um, three-way selector. selector. Yeah, well, God, is, Mallory it, is this how it starts? Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and uh, the Mallory capacitors, yeah. Yeah, so it's really, it's like really nice stuff. I mean, this, is, maestro, not, this, uh, this is not different from um, what you'll find in some custom shop stuff, you know. Well, and, what, the, and on the original, really, yeah. I guess. Yeah, yeah. So really what we've got is, um, you know, as we mentioned before, single piece mahogany neck, mahogany body, mm. great hardware. Um, you've got this short... Um, Maestro, yeah, uh, yeah. I, mean, I flipped it around there, but uh, yeah, um, trend, which has actually been this has been a little bit of a revelation. I mean, I don't think that you know traditionally the maestros in their various forms haven't enjoyed the the very best of reputations for staying in tune, mm, but mm. Um, this this particular one, rather than the, the up and down version, does actually stay oh, yeah. in pretty well. And this one has been really well behaved. It's been very very good. Yeah, Do you want to give us a little really really on the, show, us the, mean, show us the custom buckers and maybe a little bit? Of the, I won't do the, the Star Spangled Banner or anything. It might be a bit much, but um, yeah. Uh, so I might save the bridge for last. Sure. Actually, the, uh, if I start with the middle, which is what I think from memory. <laughs> How many notes was that? Am I going to be done for copyright? But so it's just plugged into the JTM45 Mark II, yeah, um, and just turned up really loud. I'm obviously not in the room with the speaker. It's a nice sound, isn't it? Actually, They're yeah, good humbuckers. Those. Are and just, just this bridge, you know, where you think, what will this be like? Because sometimes bridge humbuckers can be a bit disappointing, but. I actually really like the way that this thing sounds. And uh, as a sort of point of order, really, the, the mounting style here, straight into the scratch plate with no surrounds. Quite often I found that some guitars, it all feels a little bit flimsy, but these are obviously foam backed or something. Maybe there's something in there. They're, they're actually really solidly in position yeah. and you can get a decent amount of adjustment out of them. So they've done, I mean, they have gone to reasonable lengths to sort of present this guitar in a vintage spec. For example, you've got the nylon saddles, haven't we? Yeah, I like the sound of those. Yeah, they do. Nice, the nice sort of rounded off tone. They're not for everybody's cup of tea, but I think they sound great on they this guitar. They sort of seem to mellow out the attack a little bit, which they really do. Uh, six, like. 67 style three ply scratch plate. Yep. What do we say? Graph tech nut. That's a sort of Oh, yeah, it's a graph tech. Yeah, and it's really nicely cut and everything and nicely fitted, which was another thing that, 
you know, you'd have been straight out of the shop mm -hmm. and ordering that for it otherwise. But uh, yeah, and that's not given any tuning problems, um, which I partly attribute to that because they're uh, permanently kind of lubricated, aren't they? They're maintenance free. Uh, yeah, and the, uh, are these the Deluxe, Cluson Deluxe? Cluson Star, yeah, I think oh, the, the brand is Epiphone Star. Deluxe, but they're definitely, right. you know, the inspiration is very yeah. clear there. And um, you get a, you get a hard shell case with it, which is in this sort of slightly Hendrixy blue colour. It's um, a 60s colour, isn't it? It really is, yeah. And um, I think there's like a little signature on the back of the headstock. There and, is, I don't know if that's something that you oh, might yeah, it's like shoot a Jimmy's. separately, but it's uh, got that next to the unfortunate sticker, I'd be taking that off. Yeah. The, you know, don't put it in the bin <laughs> sticker. That's and of course, a, a, a nod to the fact, well, Jimmy was left, a lefty famously, and of course you've got three strap buttons. Um, one yeah. of the reasons Jimmy liked these, I've, I've read over the years, and um, I think I might even have been told by someone who used to work with him, was that, um, of course, they're very reversible. There's, there's yeah, no, sort yeah. of, if you flip them, there's no it's the same sticking shape. out the wrong yeah. way, you know. Yeah, and the access is great, yeah. Yeah. So, so um, uh, things that um, th th those are all the great points. Um, nothing wrong with the fingerboard, but it is laurel. It's not. It's yes, not a rose running. Nice so that's yeah, a bit different yeah. from the thing. Nicely so, fretted. Good fret work on there. Yeah. And the nice shaped neck. What is it? A C. Yeah, something like a, a something C shape. But uh, I mean, it's a good. It's it's not a big chunky thing, but it's not one of those super narrow ones that I find actually yeah. can be uncomfortable. In, yeah. Uh, but it's a really nice shape. I don't think that anybody watching would have an issue with that neck shape. Yeah. Um, and um, in terms of price, and this is this has been the thing with these Epiphone inspired by Gibson, like some people really balk at the idea of this, but the, this one is £1,500, which seems to be the sort of about the, what they're charging for these inspired by Gibson, because they've yeah. made, yeah. They've made um, you know, the greeny style Les Paul, haven't they, in Epiphone? Yeah. And they have done a couple of other things, like some 63 spec um, SG Les Pauls. Oh, the SG Les Pauls, yeah. yeah. In fact, I played played that, yeah, yeah, a few well, months back. I mean, to be honest, it, it, you know, we're, our response to the Ep Epiphone's had a funny life, hasn't it? Because it started off being the sort of slightly posher, you know, sister to the Gibson brand, didn't well, you? Well, yeah, because Gibson sort of acquired base. them, didn't they? Yeah. I know, I, I'm not sure now whether it was the late 50s. Yeah. I'd have to sort of look it up. But then, and and they were made in Kalamazoo, weren't yeah. they? And they put their best people on it. Apparently, yeah. they, were, they wanted to get Epiphones into dealerships that were too close to established Gibson dealerships so that they had two products to sell. But they wanted the Epiphones to be like the Riviera and all this stuff with the lovely sort of inlays, and oh, yeah. of life inlays and things. Um they wanted them to be almost like a, a cut above. You yeah, know? the deluxe yeah. kind of. And yet right, we've got, we've gone through the gone through the whole sort of period where Epiphone um, became the you know Japanese made offering, or the uh, you know and and then and then sort of acquired this new reputation as the budget arm of Gibson. Yeah. And through the nineties, that's continued. And since Gibson's been under its current ownership, it's kind of been re rehabilitated. Sounds a bit mean but it has it has gone up in spec and general oh, yeah absolutely i mean certainly from my point of view if you'd want a guitar that you didn't have to take immediately out of the shop and then rip out the electrics yeah. i mean that's not to say that there isn't any such thing as an epiphone that sounded great uh, but i just find that as we were talking earlier weren't we i think that it's almost more important than changing the pickups to put a decent set of pots in because yeah. it really just lets everything be heard yeah. as it should be heard and it and it really does seem to be the case with the guitar. I think there's a lot of detail and grit and grind to the humbucker sound, just as it should mm. be. They're quite vintage sounding. They are um, sort of unpotted in feel, aren't they? Because yeah, they, yeah, they are. I suppose quite like the originals would have been. Yeah. Um, yeah, their custom buckers are like that, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but give us another little blast, just to show what we mean by that. It, it, it got teeth, yeah. but it's also got. A little some nuance, isn't it? There's I mean, a... I don't know if it's it's not very scientific, but often yeah. if I want to know if a pickup's potted or not, and we're driving this Marshall a bit, you can hear yeah. that. So um, I, that doesn't mean it would necessarily squeal. I mean, a single coil would, yeah. um, but humbuckers don't always too much, especially if you're sort of careful with the volume. Yeah. And I suppose a lot of modern day stages, you're not that loud in your in ears. No. But... <laughs> That's what I think is quite impressive. 
a, a lot of the time bridge sorry neck humbuckers can be a bit anodyne a bit like a sine yes, wave yeah it can be oh yes i know yeah. exactly what you mean that kind of whistly fluty yeah, yeah. And it doesn't really do a lot for me but that one has actually got a bit yeah. of especially character. further up There isn't a bad sound, I don't think, on any of the no. switchings, and that is not something to be taken for granted, really. No, Often not. it's a case of, well, choose your pickup, yeah. Yeah. you know, have it EQ'd for the bridge or neck. And what happens when you dial, roll, the, the, roll the volume back a little bit? I don't think it's 50s wiring or anything like that, but you can tell that the quality... Yeah, it doesn't completely, yeah, you know. Yeah. It's not like someone's put a woolly jumper. Yeah, I know that people are, sort of have their own opinions about it, but I personally always like it when it retains a bit of the mm -hmm. that sound. I don't like it when I've got suddenly a really bright sound at the top and a woofy sound down there. I mean, great, and especially on the net. One day I'll learn what, what the controls actually do. I'm a professional. It responds very well, actually. I mean, um in, inherent to the design is the fact that, you, as Richard, you can see from Richard sitting here, to stop the thing sliding off your knee when you're seated, oh, you yeah, do have to yeah. kind of put it in I'm the I'm not trying your... to be kind of cool or anything. Like a, like a sort of classical <laughs> yeah. guitarist. Um, I, one interesting thing was, you know, on the the 58 Flying Vs, the Carina ones, they had a little rubber, like a sort of... Oh, they did on here, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was yeah. told by a, a vintage guitar dealer of, of some repute that those those were cut up rubber floor mats from the Kalamazoo factory that they made those little <laughs> things out, which I thought was a nice little detail. But but no such thing on this. So you'd probably want to get your own. I'm sure there's an aftermarket, you know. I mean, home base. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> any, kind of, any, yeah. good, any good doormat <laughs> retailer would do yeah. that. Or, uh, but I think you can get little things that fold out like a little leg. Have you seen oh, those? yes. Yeah, I've seen those on the uh, stick guitars and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, one last final detail. This, it's Mother of Pearl. Um, dots, yes, they're actually so they're, they're not ones, plastic, yeah, which is quite nice. And, yeah. um, I mean, it is a poly yeah. finish, isn't it, rather than nitro? Right, but yeah. I have to say that it's really, you know, beautifully done, and you know, all right, it won't check like a nitro, but it will always look like this. Yes, and uh, I think this is a limited run, so they're they're, they're not necessarily going to be around forever. I would expect these to be um, snapped up, actually, give, especially mm. given how nice the guitar sounds. I mean, in summary, uh, uh, you know, fifteen hundred quid. I know people have said. Oh, it's too much for an FO, it's too much for an FO. I don't know. I mean things are more expensive now, aren't they, though? And yeah, and, and really you can't really have it both ways. You, you either want the I, I think some of it is the components. Yeah. This was pretty well set up out of the box as well. I think mm. I might tweak the action on the bottom side. Yeah. Uh, it's got tens on, isn't it? Tens to what yeah. it? I can't remember what Yeah, the, ten to forty six, so pretty regular, regular gauge. And it's it's well made, and I think quite a lot of the expense with the guitar is the kind of amount of hours that have gone into fettling it mm. <laughs> at the end of the production run. And I think if we if we take away all of our feelings about brands, whatever they might be, positive or negative, we're left with the reality of what a guitar is. Does it stay in tune? Mm. Does it sound good? Does it play well? And uh, uh, you know, you have to say that 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 accomplishes all of these things. I'm very surprised, actually. I mean, just briefly, just so that people know, I'm not just saying it to be nice. I mean... So All right, managed to put it out a little bit there, but... It stays fairly well, well in, behaved. doesn't it? And, it, and it's, not, um, it's not really got the range of, say, a Strat um, vibrato, has it? Oh, no, it's, no, it's... absolutely. It's for little wobbles and things like that. In fact, I don't even know if Hendrix used that. Most of the time when I see these things, the arm's round there. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, but... Uh, yeah. It's pretty good, and I've been bending strings and doing all sorts yeah. with it, and I've hardly had to tune it, so that... Yeah, it's a great sign. Well, there, so there we are, the, the Jimi Hendrix Love Drops Flying V um, from the Epiphone Inspired by Gibson Range. And, um, yeah, if you want one, um, uh, 
probably a good idea to try and get your hands hands on one. I, I believe it is a limited run. Yeah. And um, yeah, so uh, hope you've enjoyed us uh, giving it a deep dive demo, and uh, see you next time. Mm -hmm.